Now, this, of course, this uh, class is the uh, Christian Life class. And we have worked into a series of things Christians need to know. Now, there's a lot of things that it's good to know, but there's some things we must know. We must know. And uh, so last week we started. There, We do not need, per se, understand that, to know the doctrine of the Trinity, and especially in regards that it's not true. Amen. So... Uh, but there are a lot of people that do believe that. And so if you're going to speak intelligently about it, there's some things you need to know. We do know and we need to know very, very thoroughly, amen, that hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is but one God, and we know what his name is. What is his name? Amen. So we are in this study. And so we're talking about, we began last week with the doctrine of the oneness of God versus the doctrine of the Trinity. We're not going to rehearse uh, what we studied last week, i.e. the Council of Nicaea, uh, the, quote, Presbyter Arius versus Alexander the bishop and his right-hand man, Athanasius, and... um, carrying on there. Suffice it to say, I will state this, that the doctrine of Arius, that that Jesus uh, was um, a lesser God, basically, if you can put it into a nutshell, that there is only one supreme creator, and that Jesus, uh, therefore, uh, as a man, could not be thus. And uh, that doctrine is alive and well, again, in a nutshell. And and I I don't make it a habit of calling names of various movements, but that is alive and well today in the doctrine known as the Jehovah Witness Doctrine. Hence, John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The New World Translation is, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God. Big difference there. Big difference. One little A makes a big difference. And uh, so we don't add or detract from the Word of God. Uh, and so in their effort to combat that, howbeit they combated it without revelation, they came up with the doctrine of the Trinity. Now we closed up with this last week, and uh, we're going to go through the Athanasian Creed, which technically... Uh, basic formula was at the Nicene Council, then 80 years later the Cappadocian uh, quote-unquote brethren came up with their version, and so the Athanasian Creed that is accepted today is a combination of those two plus uh, tweakings of it that came out about the 6th century, but, so that is the accepted creed, the Athanasius Creed, and so we're going to go through it slowly, scripturally, we finished up with this, so we're going to do this quickly, Uh, this is point number five, of, um, I think I can't remember, it's either 35 or 40 points we had out there. But this is point number 40. 40 points. Okay, so this is point number five. We're not going to discuss every point, uh, but, but the main essence of what they consider the Trinity. For there is one person of the Father, another, i.e., person of the Son, and another of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, point number A, by way of refutation. First of all, The word Trinity is not found in the Bible. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Now, there's a reason that the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. It's because there is no Trinity in the heavens, (laughs) let alone in the Bible. And that was a word that was coined in the second century and then made relatively popular by a man by the name of Tertullian. By the name of Tertullian. And uh, so that was the coinage of the word that is not found nowhere in the Old Testament nor the New Testament. Another refutation of the Trinity being three persons in the Godhead uh, is in Isaiah 43, 11. He said, I, singular, even I, singular, am the Lord. Forgive the repetition, but repetition 
is the mother of all teaching. Repetition is the mother of all teaching. Saith the Lord. And again, there's a reason I keep making this is because in the Old Testament, the word Lord in all capitals, L-O-R-D, when it's all the letters capitalized, is, is the word Jehovah. It's called the Tetragrammaton. It is the word Jehovah God, which no one knows the correct pronunciation, but we just settled for Jehovah. And the Jehovah said, I, even I, am the Jehovah, I'm the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. He was either mistaken or lying, but neither. He was Jehovah, and there was no Savior next to him. That's as simple as that. All right? See, Isaiah 44, 8, he reiterates this. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. So these are just two verses, amen, out of the, the stars of the heavens verses that we're looking at that all scream and declare, amen, His eternal power and Godhead. There is but one God. There is but one God. Amen. So the word Trinity is gone. All right. Then uh, Isaiah 30, excuse me, Isaiah 6, point number D, verses 1 and 3 and 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, the prophet Isaiah, saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train, that, that is uh, what we would call uh, the... Basically, let's just say it was the robe that was very, 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 very elongated, such as when uh, uh, the Queen of England would go down the, the uh, aisles of Westminster Cathedral. She'll have a long train that is pulled. A bride comes down. She has a long train, and these little kids carry the end of it, things of that nature. Well, the Lord's train, and all of that, the longer the train, the more indicative of glory was so long it filled the temple. Amen. Meaning His glory, His power, fills the temple. Amen. Verse 3, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Jehovah of hosts, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. That's how long the train is. Amen. And so these are seraphims that he sees, speaking in verse 2, and they are crying one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Uh, the whole earth is full of His glory. And there are some that in an effort to stretch themselves so painfully thin that it, that it pops like an Achilles heel, they, they, they say that the reason the angels cry, holy, 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 is to give due credence to all three persons of the Trinity. Now, they say that a drowning man will grab at a straw. That, my friends, is grabbing at a straw. Okay? And uh, so the Jehovah that said, Beside me there is no Savior. He can take all the holies you want to give Him. And it doesn't matter. It's not going to create one more, two more, or two thousand more. It just is not going to happen. Amen? The whole earth is full of His glory, not their glory. His singular glory. And then in verse 5, Then said I, Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am a man, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, singular, the Jehovah of hosts. When he looked into the heavens, and all of the angels and the seraphims were crying unto a singular God, that there was no God next to him, neither would there be one before him or after him, Amen. He was the Lord, the Jehovah of hosts. So I'm just doing this to let you know again that the Old Testament, which is the foundation from which all is built, does not teach anything but one God. And that is monotheism. Monotheism. And it is strict monotheism. There is one God. Okay, then Revelation 4.2 and immediately I was in the Spirit. This is the Apostle John. And behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. 
So he sees what Isaiah saw. And this is New Testament. And this is after the ascension of Jesus Christ. He sees one sitting on the throne. Verse number 8, And the four beasts, that is uh, heavenly creatures, rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And they're worshiping the one that sits on the throne. And then in back in Revelation 1, verse number 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. That's speaking of Jesus. Jesus is coming in the clouds. Every eye shall see him. Amen. And they also which pierced him. Amen. Are going to be aware. Speaking of of, uh, uh, humanity. Amen. Is basically the piercing. And somehow, amen, God's going to see to it that every creature sees him. Amen. I personally believe living and dead somehow. Verse number 8. Verse 7. Then verse number 8. This is what he's saying. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Amen. So the Jehovah God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ of the New Testament. The angels are still crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. To Jesus. Amen. And so, for the umpteenth time, but I'm just getting started. Praise God. All right, all right, all right. My grandson really likes this trick, by the way. He thinks it's neat. Is is God is a spirit. Repetition's the mother of speaking, of teaching, and speaking too. But anyway, uh, he's a spirit. He cannot bleed. He's a spirit. He cannot die. He's a spirit. He tempts no man, neither indeed can he be tempted. Amen. And he said, I even I am Jehovah. Beside me there is no Savior. So if there's no Savior next to him, there's no God before him or after him. He knows not any. And then he says, look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved. For I am God, and there is none else. A just God and a Savior, there is none. So this Jehovah God who is a spirit, how is he going to save fallen mankind? The first man, Adam lost it through disobedience so he himself his own right arm would get him the victory amen i know i'm using my left hand but that's just anthropomorphically speaking anyway so amen he his spirit overshadows a virgin by the name of mary and he who cannot be tempted he who cannot bleed who he who cannot die has now robed himself in human flesh And that's why John 1 and 10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him. He is still the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the Almighty God that took on humanity. He manifested himself in human form. Amen. It was not a first person of a triune God getting together with the third person of this triune God, the Holy Spirit, and deciding to send the second person of a triune God. And and so one third of God would come to the earth. It's not that way. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And he simply came to this earth robed in flesh. So at the incarnation, the birth of Jesus, a second person's son did not become flesh, but Almighty God took upon himself human flesh this is why first timothy 3 16 without controversy great is the mystery of godliness god was manifest in the flesh god himself was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit seen of angels pre- excuse me preached unto the gentiles believed on in the world received up into glory. It was one God that did it all, amen, for himself and unto himself. Now, we're going back to the the doctrine of the Trinity, the Athanasian Creed. Point number six, it states, but the Godhead of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit is all one, 
the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. I'm, re I'm reading to you the doctrine of the Trinity. This is the doctrine of the Trinity. So we have a question at this point. All right? Question. I.e., is Jesus one-third part of the Godhead? Is Jesus in the Godhead with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and that these three make up the Godhead? That's what the doctrine of the Trinity is stating. Okay? So the question is, is Jesus a third part of the Godhead, or is the Godhead in Jesus? It's as simple as that. The Trinity said Jesus is a part of the Godhead, a one-third portion, along with the Father and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, and that these three are one. That's what makes up the Godhead. So the question is, is Jesus in the Godhead, or is the Godhead in Jesus? It's as simple as that. Now, you and I could sit around and talk about it all day long. You have to have scriptural definition. Now, brothers and sisters, this is why the Word of God is all important. If you try to play a game of tennis without lines and net, you can argue all day, it was in, it was out. It was in, no, it was, I, I, I hate that ball better than you did. But if you don't have a net and you don't have lines, who knows? What, what's in and out. It's like playing badminton without a net. net. Volleyball without a net. You just There's no way without boundaries what's in and out. You've got to have it. Well, the Scripture lets us know what's in and what's out. If you're going to live for God, you have to live for God by the Word of God. Amen. And not by the, the anti-Nicene fathers. Not by those, amen, pre or post Nicaea. It has to go by the Word of God. The Nicene Council is the Nicene Council. A bunch of guys got together. Brother, this is the Word of God. And so that is what we must judge it by. So is Jesus one-third part of the Godhead, or is the Godhead in Jesus? The Bible, only the Bible can answer, period. It gives us the answer. So Colossians 2.8, let's read it. What does it say? Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Philosophy is what anybody concocts, amen, basically to survive or get through or comfort themselves or whatever. So don't let that spoil you or don't let vain deceit spoil you after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Not after Christ. Don't let any of this other stuff spoil you. You've got to follow after Jesus Christ. And then verse 9, for in Him. Everybody say, in Him. In him. Let's say it again. In him. in him. In Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. End of discussion. It's over. Not this lesson, actually. But, amen, in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So the question, is He a part of it, or is it all in Him? The Scripture says, in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is why Jesus said, the Father that dwelleth in me, He doeth the works. Amen. So, the next verse, and you're complete in Him which is the head of all principality and power. Jesus Christ is the head of all principality and power. And we are complete in Him. He's not a third part. It's all in Him. It's all in Him. Now, the NIV puts it on this wise. For in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the deity. Excuse me. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Amplified puts it this way, for in him the whole fullness of deity, the Godhead, continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression of the divine nature.
of the divine nature. Amen. If you want to know what God thinks, if you want to know how God feels, you want to know how God acts, you want to know what he would teach if he was robed in flesh, go to Jesus. Because that's when he did it. It's right there. Amen. So, now, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us unto himself by Christ Jesus. He needed to make reconciliation. So he reconciled us unto himself by Christ Jesus and hath given to us now the ministry of reconciliation to wit God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.19 God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Amen. Not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, which is what we do. Amen. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity. We're going back to the doctrine of the Trinity. Athanasian Creed 10, the Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. 11, and they, and yet they are not three eternals, but one uncreated and one incomprehensible. Now, to the word incomprehensible, we should all say amen. Hallelujah. Now, whoever... Those men at the Nicene Council, the Cappadocian Council, amen, and then the final touches on the Athanasian Creed, they all should have ran for president, praise God. Because I'm going to tell you, if you can talk like that and people believe it, you could be elected to anything. Oh, you get quiet on me, praise God. Can I tell you, you cannot have three eternals and, and yet have one eternal. One means one. Two means two. Three means three. And you can say, here's three fingers, but there's really just one finger. It don't work. It, 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 you know, come on. If you really believe that, I got a bridge. I want to sell you so bad. I don't mean to be a smart aleck. I don't want to come across that way. But brothers and sisters, a little bit of common sense goes a long ways. And a little bit of scriptural knowledge is the answer. So we have a question. We have a question to that. Here's a question. If the Godhead is made up of three eternals, which is what I think point number 10 said. If the Godhead is made up of three eternals, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Ghost is eternal. Are these three persons, which it also states are three persons. Here's the question, and I've asked this before, but are those persons finite? Or are they infinite? Now, they say they're eternals. Eternal and infinite really means the same thing. Really means the same thing. Uh, but uh, let's just use the words finite or infinite. Finite means it has an end. It is finite. It goes only so far. It may be large, but there is an end. Infinite means there's no end. In power... Glory, it's endless. So, if there are three persons, three eternals, are those three eternals, are they finite or are they infinite? Now, if they are infinite, meaning there are three endless, all-powerful, almighty, everlastingly, I mean, infinites, if they are infinites, if you have three infinities, my friend, I don't care how you cut it. you got three gods. If there are three infinities, do keep in mind, 
Jehovah God said, I, even I, am Jehovah beside me. There's no Savior. Is there a God beside me? I know not any. So if you happen to be of the persuasion that there are three eternals, if there are three infinities, then there are three gods. And if you know that, then you know more than God knows. Because God said, I don't know any. I'm it. That's the one thing God does not know. He does not know another God. Amen. Okay, if you have three almighties, you have three gods. All right? If you have three eternals, you have three gods. That's all there is to it. So you say, well, then, then they're not infinite. Uh, uh, then, then the Father and the, and the Son and the Holy Ghost, they, they're not infinite because we know there's not three gods. Well, all right, then let's say then they're finite. Okay, let's, if they're, they got to be one or the other. They either got to be infinite. If there's three of them, they got to be infinite or finite. So it can't be infinite because that means there's three gods. So let's, okay, okay, oh, you're right, they're finite. Okay, so if they're finite, then it takes three finite gods to make up one infinite God. Because we know God is infinite. But if he's made up of three persons, and they can't all three be infinite, because if they're infinite, then there's, we know there's three gods, so they can't be infinite. They have to be finite. So, yeah, that. So, so, so the Father's finite and the Son's finite. The Holy Ghost's finite. But they make an infinite God. Well, that means it takes three finite things to make one thing that's infinite. So God is made up of something which is finite. Okay? Number two, if, however, the Father is God and the Son is God and the Holy Ghost is God, and that's what the Trinity... T- yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Then, then in order for each to be God, they can't be God unless... Because it takes three to make God. But if the Father is God and the Son is God and the Holy Ghost is God, then in order... For each to be God, it takes three, so you really don't have three. You have nine. Because the, the, for the Son to be God, He's got to make, make it up of three. Because, but, but then for that to happen, you really don't have three, you got 27. You really don't got 27, you got 81. And you really don't have 81, you got 243 or 729 or 2187. It's ad infinitum. Now, before you write me off as a kook, uh, this book here is called Penn's Works, written by William Penn. Amen. After which Pennsylvania is named after William Penn. He named the city of Philadelphia. He named it. And some say, well, Philadelphia, he called it that because it was a city of brotherly love. No, 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 no. That is not why William Penn named Philadelphia Philadelphia. He named it because in the book of Revelation, the church of Philadelphia was the church that has not denied my name. Okay? And we were, Joel and I and Larry and, and Philip and her mother and then uh, brother and sister King and the daughter, we were driving through Wales and we were heading to a village called Hayon Y. And Hayon Y is a, it's an old coal mining town, but now it's full of old bookstores, bookstores, and some of them ancient, because it's Europe, and, uh, and they will have a book, big book deal there every year, and over 100,000 people come into a town that is about a third the size of downtown Rialto, okay? And uh, so, anyway, we're on the way there, and I was telling them that William Penn the reason William Penn ended up with all that land in Pennsylvania was because his father was a admiral, a great admiral, in, in uh, uh, the kings of England's uh, navy. And the king of England owed him a large, large amount of money. And he really didn't have it to pay him, didn't really want to pay him. And, but his boy was in prison. His son William was in prison. The reason William was in prison was because he had debated the top clerics of his day against the doctrine of the Trinity. William Penn was a Quaker, and the Quakers did not believe in a Trinity at all, nor did they believe in Arius' doctrine. And, uh, and so uh, that's why he was thrown in prison, and also because he wrote a tract called A Sandy Foundation Shaken. And in that 
uh, and I'd never read it, never dreamed I'd even see it, uh, he, he decimated the doctrine of the Trinity. And so he, he, it, the Church of England, the king, put him in prison. But he got him out of prison because he, 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 uh, uh, his father wiped out the debt that the king owed him. He let William go to this strange new world, and he went there, gave him a huge tract of land called Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods. He founded the city of Philadelphia, the church of Revelation that did not deny his name. And, and, uh, and there he was. Well, so I tell him all this. We drive into Hay on Wye. We come to the very first old, old bookstore. I walk inside, and I said, where is your theological section? She said, up those steps to the left. I, it happened just like this. I walked up those steps, amen, and I turned to the left, and there was uh, bookshelves, and I was staring at these books, Penn's works. Whoa. I pulled out this book, and this was printed. In okay. was printed in 1782. This book, these books, a set of five of them, was printed in 1782. a sandy foundation shaken and there it was and so I started reading a sandy foundation shaken and uh, that that I just gave you about the infinites and the infinities and uh, that which is finite and infinite that is part of William Penn's refutation of the Trinity that's where I got that and this, in every single scripture we use, he's got it right here. Amen. So we got good company, praise God. Can I tell you, there's a host of people down through the centuries have never bought in to the doctrine of the Trinity. They said, no, 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 we, we ain't going there. We're not going there. Amen. Deuteronomy 6, 4, brothers and sisters, there ain't no 2100 and so. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. What we teach is simple, it's plain, it's very easy. It's very, very easy. I was reading here a while back, and there was somebody of Trinitarian persuasion that was warning people up against the, the oneness people, the strict monotheists, with us, praise God. He said, you've got to be careful, because their doctrine makes so much sense what he said. He said, you really got to be careful because their doctrine makes so much sense. Wow. It's like one and one is two. Be careful now. Okay. Okay. Hero is the Lord our God is one. The Athanasian Creed. Let's go back. Point number 12. So likewise, the Father is almighty. The Son is almighty. The Holy Spirit almighty. So it goes back. If you got three almighties. Okay. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. Okay. Well, Isaiah 45, 21 through 23. Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, Jehovah? There is no God else beside me. It's just God and His Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me, all ye, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God. There is none else. Let's answer this scripturally. Let's go back to the book. Amen. Go back to the book. Amen. Verse 23. For I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. And shall not return that unto me. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Philippians 2, 9 and 11. Speaking of Jesus Christ. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him. And given him a name which is above every name. 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Amen. And that every knee should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen, amen, amen. Okay. All right. Uh, let's, 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 let's do this. Preston, come on up hither. Jaron and Gavin, come on up hither. Okay. You guys stand right here. I'm not being sacrilegious, but I want us to think. Preston, whereas thou art the tallest, you be in the middle. Let's just say there's a trinity. There's three persons in the Godhead, more or less co All right? Co equal, co eternal. All three almighty. All right? In the Old Testament, Jehovah God said unto me, let's say this is the Father, and this is the Son, and this is the Holy Spirit. Okay? Unto me. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. What he said, right? Okay. Every knee shall bow. And the, whole, the Trinity says that, that they are persons. So, you guys bow. Bow. Because he said it. Every knee is going to bow. Okay. Can I get that bow? But in the New Testament... It says unto Jesus, every knee is going to bow. So now, Father and Holy Ghost, you got to bow. Because in the New Testament, every knee is going to bow to Jesus. There is something rotten in Denmark. There is something wrong with all this picture. Amen. And so, we need to get this down. Because if you ever get to talking to a Trinitarian... Take them for a walk in the woods. But just don't leave them there. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Thank you. Amen. God bless them. Okay, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator. one God. I remember when I was in, when we were in Turkey, and we were, I was explaining this to our guide. I, I was talking to our guide, and I said to our guide, I said, you know, we're not like other groups that you take through the regions of the seven churches of Asia. He said, is that right? I said, no, because no, he takes all kinds of Christian groups there. I said, we're, we're monotheists. He goes, oh, yes. I said, we're very strict monotheists. He said, oh. I said, we do not believe in the Trinity. He said, uh, so, and he was Muslim. He said, so you're Jehovah Witness. I said, oh, no. No, 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 no. And so I was trying to teach him this, but I had a shirt on. But lucky I, I, had, a shirt, I had a shirt that would stretch, and I'm trying to get them to see this. It was tough, man. It was tough. I started to share that with you. So anyway. Uh, I, I said, uh, there's one God, and over here is man. Man is fallen, and man needs saved. And, and Jehovah God said, I and I am the Lord, and he's saving us from those demons. So how is there going to be a mediator between God and man? There is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. God became flesh and dwelt among us. He is the mediator. Amen. Again, to it, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And then Colossians 2.9, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jehovah God became flesh and dwelt among us. It was not a first person getting together with a third person and them sending the second person Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It's as simple as that. Again, back to the Athanasian Creed, the doctrine of the Trinity. Point number 20. So there's one Father, not three fathers. One Son, not three sons. 
one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And this, uh, point number 22, in this trinity and in this trinity none is a four or after another none is greater or less than another 22 the whole three persons are co-eternal and co-equal so that in all things as the four said the unity in trinity and the trinity in unity is to be worshipped note he therefore that will be saved must thus think of the trinity They say, if you're going to be saved, that's what you've got to think about the Trinity. Uh, I remember Brother Mooney, he was telling how years and years ago he was teaching on the radio and he was teaching the oneness of God and he got a phone call. I'm going to really cut to the chase on this. A man called him and he was the fourth, large, the fourth best known world theologian. He had represented the Lutherans in the, in the um, council, World Council of Churches for the last big four synods they did. He was, in, he was 80 years old at the time. He wanted to meet with him. He sat down with him at breakfast. They had cups of coffee. He pushed the coffee aside. He looked at Brother Mooney and he said, I want to know, do you really believe what you teach on the radio about the oneness of God? He said, yes. This man said, are you willing to die for it if need be? He said, if need be, I trust, I think I am, you never know, but I hope that I am willing to die for this doctrine. He said, well, that's good because for it's over, you may have to. And he said, we know that you are the most scriptural people in the world and that your doctrine predates the Nicene Council. That's what he said. The world knows. They know. So to say that you got to think this to be saved, ooh, all right? You got to think this to be saved. This is a picture of the Trinity of a statuette of Alma, Almuk. Uh, Czech Republic. This is the Father. This is the Holy Spirit. Down here is the Son. Okay, this is depictions of the Trinity. This is in the Book of Hours of the British Royal Library. Uh, flames, tongues of fire. Here's doves. Uh, there's three persons, three faces under one crown. So that's their depiction of the Trinity. Now, if you're going to think thus to be saved, you're in trouble. Here is Paris, France, St. Denis Church. Here's the Father holding the Lamb, which is the Son being overlooked by the dove, uh, the bird, which is the Holy Spirit. Here is in the uh, Gaudenzio Church of Avrevia. Uh, and this is, of course, excuse me, that was the, of course, the Father, the Holy Ghost, and then the Son. This is in Antwerp, Belgium. You see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have to think thus to be saved, you're in bad shape. You're in bad shape. I remember Brother Terry telling one time how he was having a debate with a man over the Trinity. And he said, I was nervous. He said, Booker, I was nervous. He said, he said I was behind my lectern. He said, my knees were shaking. And he said, and he said the question was this, something about describe your God as you see him. And said, this man said, I see a father. I see a son, I see a dove. And Brother Terry said he quit shaking. He quit shaking. He was so happy. And his first words out of his mouth is, well, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't ever want to go hunting with you. If you can't tell the difference between a bird and a person, you're in bad shape. And, uh, and then he took off from there. He took off from there. Okay? Now, so in all things, as foresaid, the unity and trinity, the trinity and unity to be worshipped. He, therefore, that will be saved must think of, must think thus, thus, thus think of the trinity. We don't think that of the trinity. We don't think there is a trinity. We know there is one God who spoke it all into existence. Hallelujah. Who overshadowed Mary and robed himself in human flesh. 
a man took upon him the form of a man. It behooved him, a man, to be made like unto his brethren, so that in all points he could be tempted exactly like you and I, yet without sin. And the man, Christ Jesus, was God who manifested himself in humanity. And I hope you can catch this, because to me, it's awesome. You have Almighty God that said, I'll bring people unto myself. I will save. So he manifests himself in human flesh. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus said, the words I speak, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. Amen. He said, I do whatever the Father shows me. Amen. And so that when they took him to Pilate's judgment hall and beat him, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Almighty God was feeling every single blow in a body that he made that he could dwell in and reach. He had to be as human as Adam in order to purchase us back through the submission of the humanity, which was the manifestation of deity. And then he must needs die. And you can't kill God. So God, who is manifest in flesh, the Spirit had to leave that flesh. And that's where he felt so alone. And the humanity, who was as human as you and I, but was divinity, amen, manifested in humanity, said, My God, my God! Why hast thou forsaken me? Because when you die, your spirit leaves. He gave up the ghost and died. The humanity died. They took the dead humanity and put it in the sepulcher. But the spirit re-entered it. Raised it to life glorified it, magnified it. And John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I saw one sitting on the throne. And he said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and last, which is and was and is to come, the Almighty. I'm going to close with this. And uh, Pope Pius XII, the first of November, 1950, declared the doctrine of the assumption of Mary, meaning that Mary never died, that Mary was caught up into the glory world, as was Jesus, she never, but she never died. That's the doctrine, Catholic doctrine of the assumption of Mary. In 1950, they made that official dogma, doctrine. Okay, uh, the... The, back in the 1950s, the rest of the Christian world weren't as acquiescent then as they are now. Um, listen to me. The Antichrist is coming. I want Jesus to take us out of here. I'm going to tell you, the quote-unquote Christian world, the political world, everybody is going to swallow the Antichrist, hook, line, and sinker. There will be some, amen, Scripture tells us that does not. And so now they wouldn't even raise a fuss over something like this. But back in 1950, they did. And, and especially one of the biggest screamers of it, there were many denominations that were upset, but the Southern Baptist group thoroughly denounced the Catholic Church over the doctrine of the Assumption of Mary. And they would put up billboards down in Dallas. I mean, they really went after it. And there is about how it was totally unscriptural, and without any biblical basis whatsoever, the assumption of Mary. So, the Catholic Church responded with their own billboards. Brother O.C. Marler has a picture of the billboards. The Catholic response to that was this. What's the problem? We gave you the doctrine of the Trinity. You don't want to swallow the doctrine of the Assumption of Mary, but you swallow our doctrine of the Trinity. 
And it is totally unscriptural without any biblical basis. Brothers and sisters, anybody glad for their Bible? Yeah. Musicians, come. Let's all stand. I thank God for His truth, which endureth forever. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hallelujah. Thou shalt love Him with all of thy heart and all of thy soul and all of thy mind and all of thy strength. Hallelujah. I'm glad for the truth of Almighty God. And everybody said, Amen. Let's love Him. Jesus, we love you. Thank you.